And the real challenge for the believer is what is going to help me in the pursuit of learning how to be the kind of person who joyfully lays down my life to serve others. And there is no greater pathway to that than fatherhood and motherhood, historically for most people. So yeah, Jess, what is this stirring up for you? Yeah, I just think of Proverbs 31 and how like there, when I think about my own like motherhood walk, I'm just like, there are so many things I have yet to learn and how that's going to bless my family. And so when, yeah, it seems so narrow, I just think of Proverbs 31. I'm like, but there's such a vision cast there of how to be a matriarch and what that looks like. And there are so many intellectual skills that I have yet to learn and figure out what even right now with little kids, like what is like my best invitation for blessing my family and what does that look like? And so it can look so many different ways depending on our season. But I think, yeah, I just go back to Proverbs 31. I just think there's so much there that could be unpacked in a lifetime of what the Lord's vision is for us and just what a sweet invitation that is. That's so good. Yeah, that's great. Does anybody else want to pick up on on Proverbs 31? Because I do think that chapter offers a pre-industrial revolution vision of motherhood that oftentimes shocks people who think that the Bible is teaching a 1950s housewife version of of motherhood. So yeah, any any thoughts that y'all have on on how that how might that impact what he's describing here as this sort of visionless situation that mothers are in? Well, I, I think that I agree with what Jess said, because I feel like 20 years ago or so I, the Proverbs 31 woman was so intimidating to me to the point of like, almost really not liking her. (laughs) I was like, ah, she, ah, I have to do that. She does this. Of course she gets up while it's still dark out. And of course she makes bed coverings for all her beds. And, you know, it just seemed like so overwhelming. And then you know, getting to like grow in my own talents and abilities and my own motherhood and understanding how to manage a household and how to, how to have help in the home. And, and all of these things have matured me and grown me to the point where I can read it now and be like, Oh, I, I did that one. I remember 20 years ago, it seemed so overwhelming, but I I made a blanket for my bed, (laughs) one of them. So just like the, the idea that this is like a, the long game, you know, and, and she is someone whose um, children rise up and call her blessed. So first of all, her children can stand and then her children can speak. So they're probably not super little. So this is a woman who's maybe a little bit older. And then the, her husband sits at the gate. So that indicates that he's probably an elder. And so she's probably just an older woman and has gone through a good amount of life. And and I, I have found anything that I can look at in there and be like, oh, I did that that one time or, or be encouraged to keep going. It's like, I had to learn something to get there. I had to work really hard to be able to, to accomplish that task or to do that thing or to have that goal or to get up while it was still dark out, it took a lot of self-control and like all that stuff. So I feel like there is a lot of vision there that can still grow us as at the individual us as we're a part of a team. Yeah. Annalisa, yeah, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think I agree. I think it's really important to look at that stuff, look at Proverbs 31 as a measurement almost, because when I read this tweet, I think, okay, so what is the measurement that's being used here? It's really like the what looks like strength, what looks like perseverance. And of really, it's cultural, right? So when you've hit your career, when you've made it by yourself, when you can live in an apartment by yourself and not depend on anyone, you've made it and you're strong and you've persevered and you've overcame. But when you look at Proverbs 31, really the measurement is, do my kids stand up and call me blessed? And like you were saying, April, that's long-term, that's long-term vision casting. So that's really what, that's what our measurement is as moms and wife, like that's what we're aiming for. So measurement isn't, and raising girls, like I don't want their measurement to be, okay, have you made it? Are you making enough money? Are you doing all of these things? No. Are you raising a family that will grow up? Your children will grow up and call you blessed as well. And your husband is sitting at the gates and vision casting for his family too. 
I think that's, I think that's a kind of interesting perspective too. Yeah. And you know, a couple of the, of the statements made in Proverbs 31, things like she considers a field and buys it. So she's an investor. Um, she's entrusted with the multi-generational assets of the family and she's shrewdly investing them. Talks about how she basically manages a whole uh, team of, of servants. And so you're, you're really, you, you, this picture of, and this, this is the, this is sort of that pre-industrial revolution household. And this is, this is where I think things really broke down for women so dramatically. And that is that before the industrial revolution, the household was always an economic engine and the mother was always sort of in the center of that hub. And so the idea that she wouldn't have, you know, intellectual challenges in the home didn't make any sense. Of course, she was constantly challenged because mm -hmm. she and her husband were a team trying to develop this economic engine. And, uh, and this was all integrated with the way they're raising their kids and the way that they were caring for their, their parents and, you know, the way that they were thinking about their future grandchildren and the way they were expanding the family's uh, land holdings and assets and everything like that. So this, this was a way that families lived for, you know, for hundreds or thousands of years before suddenly there was this hyper special specialization introduced to us because of the industrial revolution. And that was such a dramatic shift. And this is why so many Christians are confused because Christians, we have all these stories and all this. And even when Paul says things like, you know, women should be busy at home. Almost everyone thinks about from, I think it's in Titus two, the, the people's, the image people have of that is, you know, uh, a, a mom with a couple of kids who are off at school and she's running around, you know, maybe vacuuming. <laughs> it's like that, that was not like, nobody thought that when Paul wrote that in, uh, in the first century, what they pictured was everyone was trying to be busy at home. The father was constantly trying to uh, participate in various economic activities to expand the family, but the wife would be managing and also participating in, in, in that kind of economic expansion of the family. And so it's just it, because work shifted, the family got dramatically disrupted. And, and so trying to figure out what that means is what we've been really working through at family teams. But the reality is we live in a free country and anyone, anyone listening to this, you could all decide to develop the kind of family team that existed before the industrial revolution. It's actually easier now than almost any time in history. There was a, there was a period economically where this is really difficult, you know, when you just, just kind of the, the Dickinsonian era, it was like where it was just required enormous capital to, to own a business or to start anything uh, because things were, were becoming so industrialized from that point until probably the forties or fifties. But today, man, there's just thousands of opportunities for families to become households and to have economic engines and to work together as a team. And it's just a decision you have to make. You have to decide if you want to go that direction or not. 